Open your Bibles with me, please, to the book of 1 John. To the book of 1 John. The message today is going to be one of the most important messages that I will deliver this year. I'm asking you to listen attently. I'm asking you to follow along in your Bibles with me and see the scriptures for yourselves. These are going to be very, very important. I realize that the vast majority of Christians across America will reject this message out of hand. I am absolutely 100% convinced that what I'm going to be talking about today, if followed, would save our republic, would restore liberty in our country, would take us off of the path of destruction that we are currently on and would bring God's favor back to our nation. But it's going to present truths that very few people are willing to deal with, much less accept. So I'm asking you to, to go through this with me very carefully and let's see what God's word has to say. And if, if, there's any, if there's anything that this message can do to help anyone, those that are not only in this room, but those who are going to be watching this message in months and years to come online or on video, to bring back a sense of normalcy to our country, then the message will be worthwhile. But I go into it understanding that many, many people are going to reject out of hand what the essence of this message was going to say. It doesn't change the truth of it one whit. It, it just means that we are in a generation of people who literally, including Christians and churches, who literally do not want the truth. They do not want the truth. They want to be fed lies. They want to feel good. They want to believe in something that isn't so. And anything that challenges their comfort zone is immediately repudiated out of hand. The problem is not the truth. The problem is the people who refuse to regard truth as truth. I ask that we have as little moving around as possible so that as to have as little distraction among the people as possible. Let me start out by just saying this. America's biggest problems are not capital letters, liberal Democrats, as disgusting as many of them are, or Muslims, or Russia, or Iran, etc., etc., etc. Those are not America's biggest problems. And a word of strong counsel to you. Stop. Cease. Desist. From reading or listening to this so-called QAnon source that's spreading pure 
propaganda. I promise you, QAnon is as phony as phony can be. Can be. There is not an ounce of truth to it. It is pure propaganda baloney. And if you are listening and giving any credence to QAnon, you are being deceived, you are being propagandized in a major, major way. None of these predictions that this fellow or group of fellows, whoever they are, this cabal of propagandists that are putting this out are going to take place. None of it is true. It's all a hoax. I'm telling you, QAnon is a hoax. And if you are listening to it, you are listening to a pack of lies and deception. Number two, stop listening to the warmongers who are itching for a war with Iran. The same warmongers that took us into a never-ending war in Iraq and Afghanistan are the same ones that are about to take us into a never-ending war with Iran and Syria. It's all a part of the globalist conspiracy to entangle the United States into a never-ending, perpetual, everlasting war on terror, which there is no such thing as a war on terror. Terror is a strategy. How in the world can you fight? In a, how can you have a war against a strategy? That doesn't make sense. It's just salesmanship. It's marketing technique to convince the American people that they are at risk from these foreign powers and we've got to go on the offensive to preserve America, etc. It's all a bunch of contrived, manipulated propaganda. For example, I'm hearing now all the time, and, and, the, and the number that keeps coming out is 35. They say there are 35 Iranian Hezbollah Islamic terror camps in the United States ready to strike. Really, question, if they know how many Islamic terror camps there are, they also must know where they are. So if they know where they are, why do not they go take them out? <laughs> think, people. Think. This is nothing more than a precursor to put fear in the hearts of the American people, which will help them to accept this war on Iran that is about to be launched. I have already documented in my columns that the vast majority of the so-called Islamic terror cells that they find periodically around the country, and I've documented this, are nothing more than FBI false flag operations. The FBI created the terror cells. They set them up. They supplied them with the, the ammunition and the, and the weapons. They brought in their agent provocateurs, and they galvanized them. Who knows? They might have even brought in Israeli Mossad to pretend that they are Islamic extremists. The, the Mossad does that in the Middle East all of the time and in Eastern Europe. A lot of these so-called Islamic terrorists that you are, well, I'm not saying that there aren't any Islamic terrorists, there most certainly are. Don't construe something I'm not saying. But I am telling you that much of this is nothing more than Mossad organized and manipulated false flag events in order to continue to stir the pot of war on behalf of the state of Israel. And America falls for it hook, line, and sinker. 
And the American people, especially conservatives and Christians and Republicans, fall for it hook, line, and sinker. I'm telling you, stop listening to QAnon. It's a bunch of phony propaganda garbage. There's not a bit of truth to it. And stop listening to the warmongers who are trying to take us into another war in the Middle East. As sincerely as I know how to say it, any problems that we are having with any of these other issues that we could talk about, the, the Marxist bent of Democrats, the anti-liberty, anti-constitution, anti-republicanism sentiment that is, seems to be growing in certain elements of our society, these wars with other nations that keep propping up one after the other. All these things, the, the stuff that isn't manipulated and isn't created intentionally, which most of it is, what was, who was the president? Was it Roosevelt or Truman who said, when it comes to politics, there's no such thing as coincidences? It's very true. Most of these situations that we're talking about on the news every day and that people are getting all psyched up about are manipulations of those who have the power and the means to do so in order to bring America into this globalistic one world, new world order that has been in the making for a hundred years or more. It's a manipulation. Most of it is manipulation. Hardly any of it is coincidence or circumstantial or spontaneous. It's planned for the most part. Which means that we are dealing with an enemy that is very, very narrow in scope, very defined in purpose. It is a very organized, orchestrated, deliberate plan being carried out by a very, very powerful, sizable cabal of people who are manipulating the public opinion of the American people and the churches of America because the pastors are worthless in terms of giving information and perspective by the mainstream media which they control. But everything that happens and the few of the things that I've already mentioned are symptoms of the problem. They are not the problem. The liberal socialist Democrats are not the problem. Maxine Waters is not the problem. The Iranian Muslim Shiites are not the problem. The problem is something entirely different. These are symptoms of the problem. If you are in a ship or on a ship and a hole appears in the side of that ship and water begins to fill up the ship, you can paddle water, you can bail water with a bucket all you want. You can knock yourself out bailing water with a bucket, trying to get the water out. But you're not going to solve the problem until you plug the hole. We have a huge hole in the ship of state in the United States. And everybody's going around with their buckets trying to bail out the water. 
And they're bailing out the water with the Muslims, and they're bailing out the water with the liberal social democrats, and they're bailing out the water with Maxine Waters, and they're bailing out the water with all these things that they come up with as the problems. And they bail water, bail water, bail water, bail water, and nothing changes. Let me ask you something. Is anything getting any better? Republicans control the entire federal government. Are things getting any better? No. Donald Trump and his fellow Republicans in Washington, D.C. are spending money, borrowed money, deficit spending, like there's no tomorrow. I wrote about it in my column this week. Republicans in D.C., they are the only ones that can spend the amount of money that they spend. They spend as much money as Democrats talk about spending. They spend as much money as Democrats wish they could spend. Trillion dollar deficits. The, the, the widest deficit spending increase in six years since 2013 under Barack Obama. A 20% increase in deficit spending in 2018 compared to 2017. A $1 trillion increase in deficit spending and the Republicans control the entire federal purse. Don't tell me the Republicans in D.C. are fiscally conservative. Don't tell me they care anything about balancing a budget or reducing the cost and the size of the federal government. They don't. It is all a hoax. Smoke and mirrors. We're bailing water. We're bailing water. We're bailing water and it's not working because the hole is in the ship and the water is flooding in faster than we're able to bail it out. You've got to plug the hole. Here's the hole in the ship of state in the United States. Here is the gigantic, huge, big hole of which everything that we're dealing with is simply symptomatic of the fact that we have a hole in the ship that needs to be filled up. The hole is the evangelical church and the pastors of this country. The pastors of America have always been the compass of the country. The pastors of America have always had it within their power to direct the course of the nation. There is no other single entity within this country, including anybody in Washington, D.C., that has the power to influence the people and to direct the political affairs of state, as do the pulpits of this country. They have more power than the media. They have more power than the Congress. They have more power than the bully pulpit of the President of the United States. The pastors of America are the whole that is in the ship of state. There is not a problem that we face as a country that could not be resolved if the pastors of America showed the leadership, the wisdom, and the conviction, not to mention courage, that they need to have as men of God in the pulpits. I am absolutely 
positively serious about this statement. The pastors are the big hole. We have not direction, conviction, understanding, resolve. It's all about feeling good. It's all about entertainment. It's all about building buildings and building congregations and offerings. It's all about notoriety, prestige, popularity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the ship of state is sinking because the pastors, for the most part, I realize there is exceptions. I know several men of whom would not qualify for this indictment. Good men that are preaching the truth every Sunday of various denominations. Most of their congregations are small. Most of them are preaching to but a few people on a given Sunday. But they are preaching the truth. But they are far and few between, or few and far between. Here are the six things that pastors either are preaching wrongly or not preaching at all or ignoring or whatever, but these are the six principles that form that huge hole in our ship of state. I'm going to give you six things, and I'm not going to I'm not going to elaborate on each one, but I hope that you will write these down. I hope that you will remember these six things. And when you hear a pastor preach, if these six things are noticeable in that pastor's ministry, he is the problem in America. He is why the ship of state is sinking. Everybody thinks that we're going to elect our way out of our problems. That politicians are going to save us. Politicians have never been the salvation of a country. God through his prophets and preachers are the salvation of a country. Let me give you six, these six things. Number one, they willingly cower behind the 501c3 Internal Revenue Code. They will do most anything to maintain their precious tax-exempt status including compromising their messages to comply with IRS requirements. If that church is a 501c3 church, very, very few pastors of a corporate church have the courage to defy the rules and regulations of the Internal Revenue Code in their preaching. They just don't do it. You will find one every now and then that will. I'm not saying there are not any. There are some. I was a pastor of a 501c3 church for 35 years. And every year or so, or maybe less, I would get a very nice, glossy, printed, color, full color brochure in the mail from a law firm, usually a law firm. Never directly from the IRS. It was from a lawyer representing the IRS. And in the brochure, it would tell me 
as a 501c3 pastor, here's what I can say and what I can't say. Here's what I can do and what I can't do. And there's bullet points. And as a church, 501c3, here's what it can do and here's what it can't do. Bullet points. I totally, completely, and with much enthusiasm, ignored the brochure. I ignored it. Threw it in the wastebasket. I wish now I'd save some of those so I could still have them. I talked to a pastor just this past week. He says he still got some of his. And I encouraged him to send me a copy. I hope he doesn't forget and sends me one. I want to, I want to be reminded of what they say. But every church in America gets one of those periodically. And I promise you, the pastors, they don't do what I did. They don't just throw it in the garbage. They put that brochure up someplace prominently in their desk or on their wall or someplace in a file where they can refer to it and they will review those do's and don'ts and those pluses and minuses. They'll memorize it. They will rehearse those things with their staff, with their deacons and trustees and elders and other people in the church. They will review those things and they will make sure that they are in compliance with the Internal Revenue Code. They will even have conferences in their churches once in a while. Every few years or so, the bigger churches will have them maybe even more often than that. But most churches will have them once in a while, where they will bring in some IRS attorneys, and they will have a conference, or at least a meeting with the church officials, the officers of the church, the leaders of the church, and they will sit down with the attorney and the attorney will get up and talk about how important it is that the church have a good testimony with the federal government. How important it is that the church have a good testimony with the IRS. That's part of God's plan. And then they'll go through all these do's and don'ts. And if there's any questions, they'll have questions and they'll go back and forth. And whenever the conference is over, everybody will leave feeling really, really, really good about sucking up and compromising the message to the Internal Revenue Service. So every church that is 501c3 compliant is a part of the big hole in the ship of state. You want to solve the problem? Get the churches out of the, I, out of the IRS. Had a, a lady, a Trump toady, write me on my Facebook page this week or last week, and it said something about, don't you know that Donald Trump signed an executive order uh, you know, dismissing the Johnson Amendment and the Johnson Amendment no longer applies. That's the 501c3 section of the Internal Revenue Code. That's what it's called, the Johnson Amendment. Lyndon Johnson's the one that got it put in in 1954. And he got rid he signed, and he did sign an executive order. Here's the problem. A presidential executive order cannot overturn a law enacted by Congress. Only Congress can remove the Johnson Amendment from, from the Internal Revenue Code. It was an act of Congress that put it there. It'll have to be an act of Congress that gets rid of it, and Congress is not going to get rid of it. You know why? Because the pastors and the churches themselves are the ones who want the Johnson Amendment to stay in place. Number two, they have taught an unscriptural, erroneous, and enslaving interpretation of Romans 13 that has turned courageous Christian men into sniveling subjects of the state. 
Anytime you hear a pastor, a preacher, a televangelist, a radio preacher, talk about Romans 13 with the context that the Bible teaches that Christians are to always obey the state is a part of the whole in the ship of state in America. Christian men of history were the most courageous, independent-minded, God-fearing men that you would find anywhere, anytime. It was the Christian men of Lexington who stood on Lexington Green in front of 800 British soldiers and refused them access to take John Adams, excuse me, Sam Adams and John Hancock prisoner and would refuse to let them take the firearms that were cached and conquered. It was Christian men who understood that civil authority, just like any other authority given to man, is limited and jurisdictional in scope. That a Christian has no king but Jesus in his heart. That King George was not his king. Those British troops were not their king. And the British law that required the seizing of those two patriots, Adams and Hancock, and the seizing of those firearms at Concord were not in accordance with the natural laws of God and the biblical laws of liberty. And 75 or 6 Christian men stood on Lexington Green and through their efforts fired the shot heard round the world that began America's war for independence. Christian, Christian men. The difference between the men of Lexington in 1775 and the men of America in 2018 is they do not have pastors like Jonas Clark in their pulpits. They're taught submission to government constantly. They're taught compliance, compliance, submit, submit, constantly, constantly, constantly. If you watch much Christian television, and if you do, I feel sorry for you. And if you listen to much Christian radio, and you listen to a lot of these Christian, Pat, you cannot go a week. You cannot go a week without hearing a pastor propagandize about Romans chapter 13. It's constant, ubiquitous. They've taken courageous Christian men and turned them into sniveling subjects of the state. That's a part of this big hole. Number three, they have abandoned the great Christian beatitude, blessed are the peacemakers, and have become cheerleaders for the neocon warfare state. I saw some clips this week as I was preparing this message of some charismatic churches and some Baptist churches. I think all the ones I looked at were either charismatic, assembly of God, or Baptist denominations. And I, I saw the clips of these pastors as they were literally implanting war fever in the hearts of their people. As they were promoting war of aggression against Iran and Syria and other Middle Eastern nations. And I mean, I, I was watching those clips and, and those preachers 
sounded just like Goebbels and the other propagandists of the Nazi Third Reich as they were promoting war fever among the people of Germany in the 1920s and 30s. If you closed your eyes and if the subject matter was, was a little different, you were listening to the propagandists of Nazi Germany in 2018 so-called Christian churches in America. War, 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 war. Christians used to be known because this is the way Jesus, Jesus taught us 2,000 years ago that they were among those who were the most who were the quickest to try and promote peace. Christians were known as being peacemakers. Today Evangelical Christians are among the most enthusiastic warmongers in the whole country. No one cheers for war like Christians. No one demands war like Christians. No one wants war like Christians. The Church of America has become a warmongering church. There is no such thing as peacemaking anymore in the vast majority of churches. It's all about promoting war, war and more war. I hope you understand the things I'm talking about here are things that God cannot bless in his church. God cannot bless churches and pastors who grovel before the government. God cannot bless churches who have an unscriptural teaching relative to government in Romans chapter 13 and place government as God in the hearts of their people. God cannot bless a church that is not a church that believes in peace and has a heart promoting peace and desiring peace. A war-filled church cannot be blessed by God. Number four, they have become little more than glorified sycophants of the Republican Party and of Republican presidents in particular. The standards and principles they profess to believe do not apply to the Republican Party. And by their actions, or should I say inaction, Republican presidents are above the U.S. Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the natural laws of God, including God's law of nations. Whenever a Democrat is in the White House, and whenever a Republican is in the White House, means nothing to me when it comes to the principles of truth, biblical truth, natural law truth, the Constitution, Bill of Rights, Declaration of Independence, when it comes to those fundamental principles of truth, I stand for and against the exact same things. The difference is when a Democrat's in the White House, I am a hero. Oh, I'm helping the cause of freedom. I'm a freedom fighter. I'm a patriot. But when a Republican is in the White House and he does the same things that the Democrat would do and ignores the same principles of truth and law that the Democrat did, and I call him on the same carpet as I called the Democrat, now I am a villain. And people 
curse me and call me every name in the book. In Jesus' name, of course. <laughs> the principles don't change. Amen. If deficit spending is unconstitutional, immoral, bankrupting our country, ruining the future generations of America. If it was wrong when Barack Obama was doing it, it's wrong when Donald Trump is doing it. Yeah. It's a part of the whole. Whenever the Democrat is in, then they are all energized about standing for truth and standing for the Constitution, standing for limited spending and limited government and, and, and limited war and all these things. They stand up for all of that. But as soon as a Republican goes in, all those, all those values and principles go right out the window. You don't hear anything about it. Oh, we don't want to say anything bad about this Republican president because he's better off than the Democrat. What's that got to do with anything? Where is it written that because you vote for somebody that that means for the next four years you've got to go along with every unconstitutional thing that comes off of their desk? In fact, truth is, if they profess to be conservative, if they profess to be constitutional, if they profess to be in favor of limited government and pro-life and all these kind of things, issues that we believe in, we should be more eager to make sure that they abide by what they said they would do. It's a, I'm telling you, and this is where the churches are. Number five, they have traded unpopular truth for the God of success. Big buildings, big offerings, large staff, notoriety, popularity, etc. They've traded unpopular truth in order to keep people coming in. Building their crowds, building their offerings, building their staff, building their programs. Success, success, success. And truth is the loser. This is the real problem in America. Not the Muslims, not the liberal Democrats, not the news media. This is America's biggest problem. Straighten out the pulpits of America and you will solve America's political problems. It is a church problem. It is a preacher problem. It is a pulpit problem. And lastly, number six. They have allowed themselves to be blinded by the Zionist state of Israel. They willingly refuse to see the pervasive evil influence that Israel exerts over America. In fact, most of our evangelical pastors and churches are complicit in that evil. Now, we're going to study the scriptures and I'm going to prove some things to you about why America is under the judgment of God and why it will never come out from under the judgment of God until this is corrected. From the Word of God, I've got several passages. Please turn with me in your Bibles and read them. These verses are critically important. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. We begin in verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. John wrote this 2,000 years ago. 
and he said, it is the last time, or it is the last days. You hear these preachers talking about you know, the last days started in maybe 1948, or maybe they started in 2016 when Donald Trump, or when Obama, or with Whitney, whatever. No, we've been in the last days for 2,000 years of church history. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist should come, even now, even now, are there many Antichrists. Whereby we know that it is the last time. We know it's the last time because of all these Antichrists walking around. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that it might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. No lie is of the truth. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. Who is a liar? He that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. So who are the Antichrists? Who are the Antichrists? They're the ones who deny that Jesus is the Christ. They're the ones who deny that Jesus and the Father are one. They are Antichrists. Right? Isn't that what it says? 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Whereof you have been heard, you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. They that are of their world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. He says it again. Who are the antichrists? The antichrists are the ones who deny the Father and the Son. They are the ones who deny that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is God. They are antichrists. Have you got that? Do I need to go over that again? Now turn to 2 John. It only has one chapter. Listen very carefully. 2 John, verse 7.
For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgress, transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Look very carefully at what follows. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed, for he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, what doctrine? The doctrine of Jesus Christ, Messiah, God in flesh, Savior. Receive him not into your house. Neither bid him God speed. God bless you. God bless you. Have a good day. God bless you. Neither bid him God speed. God blessing. For he that biddeth him God speed, he that blesses him, is partaker of his evil deeds. The Antichrists If you bless them, you are partaker of their evil Antichrist works. Come on. Put your mind in gear. Let God's word get into your soul. If he comes denying Christ, if he comes denying Jesus is the Christ, he is an antichrist. Do not bless him. Do not let him into your home. And if you do, you are guilty of participating in his evil antichrist works. Bear with me. Christian Zionists quote Genesis 12, 3 and apply it to the modern state of Israel. Genesis 12, 3, God said unto Abram, or Abraham, I will bless them that bless thee, Abraham. And curse him that curseth thee, Abraham. And in thee, Abraham, 
all families of the earth be blessed. And these Christian Zionists all over America apply this verse to the modern state of Israel. It's ubiquitous teaching. You cannot listen to a TV evangelist, radio preacher, pastor in a local church. You cannot listen to anyone in the pulpit anywhere in the country without hearing this regurgitated over and over and over and over again. We must bless the state of Israel because Genesis 12, 3 says, I will bless them that bless thee. So we must be a blessing to the state of Israel if we want God to bless us. They say that all the time. And I have to ashamedly confess that I taught that myself for over 30 years. God, please forgive me. This was spoken to Abram. It was not spoken to the nation of Israel then or now. Hang on, hang on. These Zionist Christian pastors completely ignore the New Testament. Especially the teachings in Galatians and Romans. Again, I hope you'll follow me with your own Bible. Turn Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. And verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not to the seeds of many, that is to the generations of the descendants of Abraham, the multiple numbers of physical seed from Abraham. No, he saith not to the seeds of many, but to one seed, and that seed is Jesus Christ. The promise to Abram in Genesis 12, 3 was fulfilled 2,000 years ago in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Skip down to verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Your biological heritage means absolutely nothing. We are one in Christ. If we are Christ's, we 
are Abraham's seed and we are heirs according to the promise that God gave to Abraham. Go to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Verses 28 and 29. Oh, we have to bless the Jews. Abram's seed. Genesis 12, 3. Plainly, the scripture tells us that the seed was Christ. And that we, through faith in Christ, are all part of Abram's seed and therefore part of Abram's promise. Verse 28, he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, meaning of the flesh. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Did you read that? He is not a Jew because he was born in Abram's lineage. Abram's physical seed. That's not a Jew. A Jew is one inwardly who in his heart has given faith to Jesus Christ. Look at chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. Romans chapter 9. Not as though the word of God hath taken non effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Are you, are you all with me? They are not all Israel which are of Israel. They are not. Israel simply because they were born as a child of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who became Israel. Their birth as an Israelite does not make them Israel. They are not all Israel which are of Israel neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children of God. Just because they're of the seed of Abraham doesn't mean they're a child of God. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. Of God. Did you get? Did you? Did you read that? They that are the children of the flesh, the fleshly stock of Abraham. They are not the children of God. They are not the children of God. Oh, they're God's chosen people. How can they be God's chosen people on the one hand, and then here it says they're not the children of God on the other hand? It's either one or the other. And the scripture is clear. They are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Who are the children of the promise? You go back to Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. Those of us who have put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are the children of the promise. So the promise given to Abraham 
under the Abrahamic covenant was fulfilled in Christ and in all those who put their faith in Jesus Christ, not those who are the biological descendants of Abraham. Could it be any plainer? Am I misinterpreting anything here? This is as clear as it can be. Skip down to verse 24. Now you got, you got to read this. Now this has got to get into your heart. Verse 24. Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but as also the Gentiles, as he saith in Hosea, or Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved, speaking of the Gentiles. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. In the Old Testament, the Gentiles were not called the children of God. But now, through Christ and through his work on the cross and the church, which baptized Jew and Gentile alike into his body, we are the children of the living God. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. A remnant shall be saved. Who are those remnant. They are the children of Israel who acknowledge Jesus Christ as their Messiah and Savior and receive him as such by faith just as we Gentiles do. That's the remnant that will be saved. The remnant. The remnant. Not everybody who is a Jew. Not everybody who is a child of Abraham. Not everybody who is of the Israel stock. A remnant. Those who come to faith in Christ. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth hath left us a seed, we had been as Sodoma or Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which follow not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. The Gentiles were not included in the Old Testament covenant. But they have been grafted in to the body of Christ through faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, that means in the Old Testament law, the Mosaic law, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. The stumbling stone is Jesus Christ. The children of Israel stumbled at the stumbling stone 2,000 years ago when Jesus came and presented himself as Israel's Messiah and they rejected him. They stumbled at the stumbling stone and Jesus became a rock of offense unto them at that point and forward. So again, Israel, Israel post the crucified, resurrected Christ, 
are an antichrist people who have rejected their Messiah, who rejected his deity, rejected his saviorhood, rejected his messiahship, and are outside the household of faith and are no longer the children of God. Now let's look at what Jesus said. Go to Matthew chapter 21. Verse 31. Jesus saith unto them, this would be the Pharisees, scribes, chief priests, Sanhedrin. Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the ways of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen him, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and led it out to the husbandman and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandman that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. He's referring here to the prophets that God sent to Israel up unto including John the Baptist, and how Israel rejected the prophets, killing them, stoning them, etc., Jesus continues. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir, come, let us kill him. Let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto them, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen which shall render him the fruits of their seasons. He was talking about the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, Sanhedrin, chief priests, scribes, etc. They, your, your fathers killed the prophets. You stoned them. You killed them, including John. The Son of God came to you, and you are going to slay him. You're going to kill him. You're going to reject him, just like you did the prophets before him. Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone, there it is again, which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, you leaders of Israel, I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall it will grind him to powder. 
And when the chief priests and the Pharisees had heard this parable, they perceived that he spake of them. Oh, wow, how astute they are. <laughs> but when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. Look at what Jesus said to them at the conclusion of this parable. The kingdom of God is taken from you. From you Israelites. From the Jewish nation. The kingdom of God is taken from you. The kingdom of God is taken from you. And given to a nation. Bringing forth fruits thereof. The kingdom of God is taken from Israel. The kingdom of God is taken from Israel. Albert Barnes writes this about verse 43, the kingdom of God. Jesus applies the parable to them, the Jews. They had been the children of the kingdom or under the reign of God, having his law and acknowledging him as king. They had been his chosen and special people. But he says that now this privilege would be taken away, that they would cease to be the special people of God, and that the blessing would be given to a nation who would bring forth the fruits thereof of right, or, or be righteous, that is to say, the Gentiles. They would cease to be the special people of God. Who is the nation? Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. The kingdom of God is taken from you and given to a nation whose, whose fruits... Who has the fruits thereof. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 5. Ye also as lively stones are built upon a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. You are in Christ. You have been saved by faith in Christ. You have trusted his work on the cross for you. You've received him as your savior, the Christ of God, the savior of the world. By Christ Jesus, you are a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. Wherefore also it is contained in this scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. There it is again. Elect, precious. He that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe. Believe what? Believe on Christ. He is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. There it is again. Even unto them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they also they are appointed. But ye, through faith in Christ, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. There it is. The kingdom of God is taken from you. The Israelites, the children of Israel, the Jews, is taken from you and given to a nation. What nation? The holy nation of those Jew and Gentile who have received Christ as their Savior and Lord. In a previous message recently, I quoted from the Jewish Talmud, which is the Bible of the Zionists, and the, and the Jews in Israel. Whenever you hear them talking about the Torah, they're talking about the Talmud. They're not talking about the writings of Moses. They're talking about the oral traditions of the fathers laid down throughout the centuries, which became ultimately the printed copies of the Talmud. The same thing that Jesus talked about 
to the Pharisees when he said, you make the word of God of none effect through your tradition. He's talking about the writings of the Talmud, what became the Talmud. The oral traditions of the elders. Starting with the 70 elders that they say in, in Moses' time. And, you know, Moses got the Ten Commandments from God. But the, but the 70 elders, who are ostensibly the fathers of the Pharisees and the modern day uh, Jewish scholars, etc. They received the more complete word of God than Moses did. God just gave to Moses a sample of his law, but he gave the real law to the elders who passed it down from generation to generation orally until finally they wrote it down starting a couple centuries before Christ and then going to about five centuries after Christ. And I quoted from the Talmud what it says about our Lord. I'm going to do it again. In the Talmud, Jesus was born out of wedlock, and I have the references. Jesus was born out of wedlock to his mother Miriam by her lover Pantera. She is said to have been the descendant of princes and rulers and have played the harlot with a carpenter. The Talmud says Jewish is a bastard child of an adulterous mother. Jesus spent time in Egypt where he learned magic. He was a magician who deceived and led Israel astray. He mocked at the words of the wise, meaning the, the elders and the, and the Sanhedrin, etc., was tainted with heresy and was thus excommunicated. He called himself God and the Son of Man and said he would go up to heaven. He had five disciples. He was tried as a deceiver and as a teacher of apostasy. He was executed on the eve of Passover, which was also the eve of the Sabbath, by being stoned. For 40 days, a herald proclaimed that he was to be stoned and invited evidence in his favor, but none was given. He, under the name of Balaam, was put to death by Pincus the robber when he was 33 years old. He was punished in Gehenna, Gehenna hell. Gehenna, I explained this once, there's two, word, two Greek words for hell. One is, is Hades, uh, which is the temporary hell, the abode of lost souls. Gehenna is the eternal hell where the soul and body have been reunited and then soul and body are cast out forever and ever in eternal fire. That is Gehenna. So Jesus is in Gehenna now and he is, he is in boiling excrement. They say our Lord, the harlot son of an adulterous mother who was a heretic, an apostate, who was nothing more than a wicked, evil magician and who was stoned to death and is now suffering the flames of eternal fire in Gehenna hell and also boiling, at the same time, boiling in excrement. That is what they teach about Jesus. That is how they feel about Jesus. That is the regard or lack thereof that they have pertaining to Jesus. Under the name of Balaam, the Talmud says he's one of those excluded from the world to come, meaning the heavenly kingdom. These are antichrists. which are already in the world, John said. These are antichrists. Now by comparison, and I did this last time and I will again today, what does the Quran say about Jesus? Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. Jesus was strengthened by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was given revelation by Allah. Jesus was taken bodily into heaven and, and is coming again. Jesus was a miracle worker. Allah sent the gospel to Jesus. Jesus spoke when he was two days old. Obviously, the Quran does not recognize Jesus as being God in flesh and the Son of God. 
The Quran teaches that Jesus is inferior to Muhammad and that he is the servant of Muhammad. So the Muslim faith does not recognize Jesus Christ to be of God. They do not recognize him to be the son of God. They do not recognize him to be God in flesh. So Muslims, therefore, the followers of the Quran, are antichrists. They're antichrists. So how is it in America and in our churches that we readily reject one group of antichrists while at the same time embracing another group of antichrists. Tell me, how does that work? Will you ever hear a Christian pastor say that America will be blessed for blessing Saudi Arabia or Iran? We must bless them in order to be blessed by God. Of course not. Do they say America will be blessed for blessing Muslims? Of course not. Why do they then turn around and say that America will be blessed for blessing Israel? Why do they say that America will be blessed for blessing Jews? Both Islam and Judaism deny Christ. Both are antichrists. Go back to 2 John again. I want to show you this again on the heels of what I just said. Verses 9 and 10. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, Receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. By pronouncing a blessing on the Antichrists of Israel, America and the churches and pastors of this country who are guilty of this are incurring the wrath of God upon them because we are making ourselves partaker of the Antichrist's evil works. So foreign aid Taxpayer dollars sent to the antichrists of Israel are bringing God's judgment on America, just like foreign aid to the antichrists of Saudi Arabia are bringing God's judgment on America. Blessing the wars for Israel brings judgment of God upon our country. When pastors get up and talk about blessing Israel, they are in fact bringing God's judgment on them. They are bidding antichrists Godspeed. God bless you, Benjamin Netanyahu, you antichrist. God bless you, Israel, you nation of antichrists. We're going to bless you, and by blessing you, we're going to have the, ju- the, the blessing of heaven. Let me ask you something. America and Christians in America have been blessing Zionist Israel for 70 years now. How blessed has America become under that time? Is God cursing America? Because God, or is God blessing America because of our blessing of Israel? Compare our, our families in 1948 to 2018. How are we doing on the, on the family scale? How are our families? Good shape? Better shape than they were 70 years ago? 
More divorce, left divorce. More, more teenage rebellion, less teenage rebellion. How are we doing on the economic front? How are we doing on the economic front? When I was a child, my dad, who was not a college graduate, who held a blue-collar job all of his life, and no, we weren't rich, and no, we didn't live in the fanciest neighborhood in town and drive the fanciest cars in town, but my dad, with his income, just his income was able to provide the needs of his family. Most families today in America could not survive on one income. The man and the wife are both working. Some of them are working two and three jobs just to make a living. Taxes is taking more money from our paycheck than ever in history. We are paying nearly five months of our income to the government in various shades of taxes. We are deeper in debt than we have ever been. We are living in a deficit that can never be repaid. There's only one thing that can happen sooner or later, and that is this economic house of cards, which is all it is, is going to come crashing down. The Federal Reserve has basically totally decimated and destroyed a once vibrant American economic system. We were the economic envy of the world. And now we are the debtor nation of the world. How are we doing economic? God, really, God blessing us? How are we doing educationally and scholastically? Is God blessing us? How, you you got you to go to, you, you, might get, you might get a 1948 high school education if you graduate from college in 2018. Maybe. Look at what happens to our kids when they go to college. Kids come out of churches, wholesome, innocent, moral. By the time they get out of college, four years of, of liberal, socialist, Marxist, antichrist indoctrination in the colleges and universities of this country, and they come out heathens. How are we doing on the education front. God, God blessing us, is he? What about religiously? What about the matter of faith? God blessing us spiritually? Christianity's dying in America. Do you know that? It's dying in America. We're, there are more professing atheists in America today than there has ever been. There are more non-church goers in America today than ever. There are more skeptics against religion in America today than ever. And we can blame the Democrats and you can blame Maxine Waters and all that and you are just bailing water. You're not addressing the hole in the ship. The problem is the pastors of America aren't preaching the word and our kids are going to hell. In every discernible category, America is in worse shape in 2018 than we were in 1948. Where's the blessing of God? Where's the blessing of God for being a blessing to Israel for 70 years? It's not, we're not being blessed of God, folks. We're being judged of God. We are guilty of saying Godspeed to antichrists. And God said in his word, whenever you do that, you are partaker of his evil deeds. And God has no, no option but to judge evil. And he's judging evil in America. 
what God tells us Christians in 2 John is that God will curse them that bless Israel or J Judaism or Saudi Arabia or Islam or Jehovah's Witnesses or Christian Scientology or any faith system and the people that promote them that deny Jesus Christ. You cannot bless antichrists and expect God to bless you. That's what 2 John tells us. There's only one answer for this country's ills. Should we try to elect the best political office holders that we can? Absolutely. Should we be active in the day-to-day -day political affairs of our country? Absolutely, as a free people who has the privilege under our constitutional form of government to select and unelect our government, we have a responsibility to be as active and as discerning and involved in these issues as we possibly can, of course. But all we're doing is bailing water. All we're doing is bailing water until the pastors of America stand up in the pulpits, shed themselves of these vices that control their preaching and teaching and be the men of God in the pulpits that God requires them to be, only then will the whole in America's ship of state be fixed. Amen. Let's stand for a word of prayer.